Hello and welcome to the Do More With Your Money show from True Potential. Today we're going to reflect on how asset markets have performed through the month of August. In particular, looking at what might have been a quiet summer's month, but how actually there's been so much going on in asset markets and how it has certainly influenced returns both in equity and bond markets. I'm joined today by a number of my colleagues from the investment management team and we'll try and bring to life through the next 20-25 minutes some of those key topics of discussion. But maybe in the first instance, George, could you just maybe bring out some of how asset markets have performed and what you've been pulling out from that in terms of some trends? Absolutely. The key aspects which are grabbing markets' attention at this point in time is expectations around the strength of economic growth, around inflation and trends which are forming there and the required response from central bankers to manage those components and meet their own targets. In all of this, bond yields are very important and we tend to discuss bonds quite a lot on this podcast and some of our viewers might ask the question why. Well, bond yields, uh, the yield on a bond um, which is demanded has an impact on the price. So as the yield moves it impacts the price inversely. So yields moving higher is negative for bond price returns. It also impacts currency markets and stock markets as well, which some of our viewers might be surprised by because essentially the yield on a bond is influential in terms of how we can value a company on a forward-looking basis used as a, a discount rate. What we've been seeing over the last number of weeks is we were getting some clearer signs that inflation was cooling. So the rate of inflation was starting to decelerate. We were seeing strong signs of economic growth, and this was leading us to believe that the Federal Reserve, as an example, in the US could engineer a soft landing. Um, Along the way, we've had central bankers who've been quite keen to clarify their appetite to keep interest rates sufficiently restrictive until they get very clear signs that the inflation targets are in sight, which means that the number and the timing of interest rate cuts which were priced in in the future have not only been reduced but also pushed out Mm -hmm. and the reaction in that is bond yields have moved higher so we've seen a challenging environment month to date for the bond market. The the interesting thing within that as you were alluding to at the start is that there's the economic data has been generally supportive Mm -hmm. and certainly in different regions you could argue it's been even more supportive of, of a better economic scenario than maybe most people envisaged at the beginning of this year. And Paul, I wonder if you can maybe bring that out in terms of certainly what we've been seeing in the US and uh, that would certainly ring true. I think, um, you know, for context, as you alluded to, you know, the start of the year coming into the year, concerns were that growth would um, uh, come down as interest rates continue to be pushed up. Inflation was still problematic, but we... um, I think collectively, but in terms of the market and our managers have been surprised somewhat just at the strength and the resilience of the US economy. If we're just thinking about how we measure economic growth, GDP for the second quarter, it came in higher than expected at 2.4% on an annualized basis. That was on the back of stronger growth in the first quarter of 2%. And that's really been driven by stronger consumer spending. The labor market has been uh, very resilient. So we've got unemployment at about three and a half percent today. Um, you've seen wage growth continue at 4.4 percent, and that's helping to fuel uh, consumption as excess savings continue to be run down. When we look at hard data, that continues to be very strong. Retail sales, um, durable goods orders, and somewhat conflicting some of the survey data that we've been receiving. George alluded to the the data that we received this week on the PMI manufacturing and services Mm. data, slightly softer. Uh, But on the whole, it's it's been uh, very good. And importantly, that we've seen inflation start to Mm. trend. So if we think about where headline CPI was last year, peaked at 9%, it's down at 3.2% today. So we've come a long way. And that's very encouraging. It's encouraging for equity markets. We've seen very strong returns from the US market year to date because economic data has been positive and inflation is trending lower. What what is it that you think has maybe sort of changed a little bit then and how the the market psyche has looked at that over recent weeks, thinking about how August has been in terms of good economic data, but certainly 
the market taking it in a negative sense in both the equity yeah. market and and in, in, in sovereign bond markets. In yeah, I, I think you know, we've we moved a long way on the inflation front, yeah. but the stronger economic data coming through, the risk is you get a re-acceleration of inflation mm. looking out over the next six months and into next year. And therefore, that does challenge whether the central bank has done enough in terms of interest rates. Yeah. It's got up to 5.5%. Does it get, need to go higher in order to bring the economy back into mm. equilibrium to ensure that inflation comes down to a sustainable level of yeah. their 2% target? Yeah, and, and I suppose maybe there it's worth bringing Kevin in to think about how, how that's all interacting. And George has talked a little bit about how that's played through in, in bond markets, but certainly how bond markets have behaved. Volatility has been really evident again, but interest rate expectations haven't changed that dramatically in terms of the past couple of weeks. Yep, I think if we um, think about the inputs into a, a bond yield um, and it would be interest rate expectations, so what's the market's path for, the, for future interest rates, inflation expectations and some form of other risk premium yep. or something else. Inflation expectations are largely contained and are actually relatively low mm-hmm. versus the actual level of realised inflation. Uh, interest rate expectations haven't moved, as you said, so there's something else worrying mm-hmm. markets and it's probably worries over the deterioration in economic data, mm-hmm. mostly outside the US, to be yeah. fair, but given the given the dominance of the US bond market on global markets, that has been affected the most. Mm-hmm. And there are other, there's some specific factors with regards to the US, the size of the US deficit um, which is helping fuel growth, which has probably worried markets in this summer period. And that probably goes back to what was happening right at the beginning of the month or even the end of, of July, yeah. really, when we, we saw the, the changes there in terms of what Japan talked about, yeah. in terms of yield curve control, the issuance that the Treasury in the US alluded to and then uh, published their details that was going to come through. All it's A combination of factors really weighing on, on bond markets, maybe more than... Um, just that inflation and interest rate trajectory. Yeah, I think it was a lot of surprising data for yeah. markets to take um, in such a sequence yeah. at a period where typically markets are just a bit more illiquid in the summer months. Mm-hmm. So there were four or five main news events over four or five days, yeah. and that has had the biggest impact on bond yields and equity equity prices uh, reacted to the move in bond yields as, as much as the news itself. Mm-hmm. And I, I suppose one of the other areas where we, we know that economic data has been really challenged has been what's been happening in China and clearly the news flow there over the past couple of weeks has brought back the, the challenges that we've talked about earlier in the year in the, the housing sector and things like that. Chris, I don't know from your perspective on China, how have, how have you been assessing what's been happening in China? What does that mean for for, for global global growth at this point in time? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I'm pretty sure everyone knows this, but but China's the world's second largest largest economy. So from a GDP perspective, it's around about 18% of global GDP. Only the US is larger at 25%. I think one of the things that we've talked about on the podcast before is um, the phrase, if the US sneezes, everyone catches a cold. And I think you know, you've got to remember that it's very important what happens in China mm. will affect global markets overall. Um, you know, if you think around kind of what we've seen in respect of GDP growth in China in the past, so if you look from, say, 1979 to 2010, you were seeing that figure coming in at just under 10% a year, so significantly higher than anything that we saw in developed markets. You know, what you are seeing is actually various different factors that are pulling down mm-hmm. on GDP growth in China overall. So things that you've just been mentioning there, so obviously the property sector, um, we saw what happened with Evergrande earlier in the week, so that's a uh, £236 billion pound Chinese property developer, they filed for bankruptcy, um, You know what you've seen is property is around about 30% of GDP mm. for China, so the property sector is huge, you've seen a lot of property companies take on debt. And then what you've seen there is that become problematic overall. As well as that, in China, you've got really high youth unemployment. I'm sure people will have seen this on on the news, but the figure there has now gone north of 20%. China's actually no longer publishing that figure as well. Mm. So they've stopped publishing that figure. Um, And I think, you know, maybe the final thing is, 
you know, we've been through zero COVID. You know, if you think about what we went through with COVID lockdowns, it was, mm -hmm. you know, three, four months of a lockdown. It was very uncomfortable. But China's been through years of lockdown mm -hmm. overall. And what you're seeing is, you know, the potential for less foreign investment. And China actually, the economy needs to mature become much more of a, a domestically focused economy in the same way that say we are in the UK or the US is overall but um, that's not I all I suppose that's a million dollar question isn't it it is can, can yeah, actually, yeah yeah can I actually do that yeah I mean um, you know if I was looking at some stats so I think from a consumption perspective China is less than 40 percent of their overall GDP which compares to the US which is mm. basically less than mm. 70 um, you know that's the, the big question. I think the other big question that people have got, which is, you know, where does China grow growth go from here? Um, you know, if we look, China's still expected to grow just under 5% this year, which is significantly higher than the UK and is higher than the US as well. I suppose the thing that I always go back to, and somebody said to me many years ago, can you believe that 5%? And I suppose this year is one of those it's years. It's a really tough year to believe that. It, right? it, it's <laughs> probably a, a challenge to believe that at times. Yeah. But Gavin, I think one of the things that Chris is alluding to there is there's there's a number of challenges, and you you talked about those yesterday and the and morning markets. For those that maybe didn't um, hear morning markets, could you maybe just recap some of those key points that you're making around infrastructure investment, how yeah. it moved into housing and the challenges that that might bring? Well, so as, as Chris has said, it's a very low consumption based yeah. economy. So if only 40% of the economy is based on people spending money for goods yeah. and services, the rest comes from basically building things, investment. Mm -hmm. and investment in infrastructure such as roads, railways and factories or utilities has declined from 30% 30, 30 year on year 2010 to now around about 4%. So you've seen yeah. a material decline in the investment in those assets. That investment has to, that slack has to get picked up somewhere else mm. and that's being residential property development. Yeah. So the main challenge that China has is that housing got too expensive based on these the big trend of people mm. Chinese people moving from rural areas yeah. to cities yeah. so China has effectively accomplished in one third of the time what the US took 70 years yeah. to achieve which is yeah. around about two thirds of the population is based in cities and that led to the average property in China being almost two times as expensive so, yeah. relative to incomes as in the yeah. US yeah. so authorities there in 2020, which was very badly timed given COVID lockdowns, decided to put a cap on the ability of people to yep. borrow, to invest in infrastructure, and also put caps on the bank's ability to lend. And that and was that effective what the three red, three red, three red lines. lines. Yeah. 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 So that this is this month is a three-year anniversary of that, but that's had the rather devastating effect mm. of inducing the corporate defaults we've seen from those yeah. most ex exposed um, lenders and developers, but also a recession in house prices, mm. a recession in sales, and just general doubt over price appreciation in the future. Yeah. And when so much of Chinese savings goes into domestic property, people want to build their wealth, yeah. plan for retirement, then when when potential buyers pull back even modestly, it creates this yeah. sort of growth shock. And it might not come through in the headline figures, mm. the 5%, but definitely what we're seeing in other real data, such as import data, yep. there's a material decline in the demand for, well, for the inputs that would go into investment. Yeah, and you can see that in, yeah. in commodity so prices, certainly. Definitely, and the interest rate cuts yeah. we spoke about yesterday, they're tiny. I mean, we were. And I, I suppose that's the contrast, material. isn't it? That as you say, they're they're tiny, they're immaterial. Yeah. Historically, it's been much more of a big bang that China's tried yeah. to to bring yeah. forward, but that as you say at the moment, is probably pretty much constrained. Yeah, and they don't have the tools available to yeah. Western economies such as fiscal stimulus in terms of tax cuts because of the unique way the economy yeah. is controlled. It's very centralised, it's very administered, it runs a fixed exchange rate mechanism. In order to control that, F, that exchange rate, it must balance the flow of capital that comes in with what yeah. goes out, and any unexpected fiscal stimulus internally could lead to that money wanting to rush out the door yeah. and buy assets overseas and the currency would likely depreciate and that's and we've not certainly seen it move a little yeah, bit yeah so that's just yeah. been this managed depreciation yeah. Yeah. very incremental very and often if we were to measure the volatility of 
their currency versus moves and say the dollar or the pound sterling day on day, yeah. it's less than 50% because it's managed, it's controlled. Mm-hmm. And the only way to con- maintain that control is effectively to control everything else, everything else, which could potentially influence it. So something, I suppose, that will continue to form part of our discussions, the discussions that we have with our managers, because it certainly is one of those things that's exercising a lot of thought at the moment as to what does happen in terms yeah. of a, a Chinese response. Paul, I just wanted to come back to, to you, and it sounds like we've talked about bonds quite a, quite a bit today, but, but really there are quite significant uh, drivers of what's been happening in bonds, but how that knocks through into, as George mentioned, valuation, but also what we see with, with banks in terms of lending, etc., and the cost mm. of lending for corporates. Yep, uh, absolutely. It's, um, it, you, bonds have you know, a big part of our, um, our job. We're multi-asset investors, and we've seen a lot of volatility in bonds. We've had a, a very come from a very difficult environment last year where bond yields um, uh, pushed materially higher, and we saw the declines in, in the prices. Um, I think from a corporate perspective, you know, they're in a good shape in terms mm-hmm. of they, that following COVID, because rates were so low uh, and lending rates were, were low, they actually pushed out the maturity of their bonds yeah. uh, and, and their debt, you know, out to 10 years. And that's left them in a really strong um, condition um, with, with, with bond yields so low. Yeah. And I suppose the other part of that is that we haven't seen um, spreads. So we haven't seen yeah. credit spreads really change that much over this, what has looked like quite a turbulent period in, in markets over the last three, four weeks. But spreads themselves exactly. haven't haven't moved that much. Exactly. And the fundamentals are, are very strong because cash levels are high, interest rates um, or debt repayments as a percentage of profits are still very low Mm -hmm. so fundamentally still strong economic growth we talked about is still good corporate earnings that we've just gone through for the second quarter have been better than expected particularly when we look at profit margins so spreads have remained very tight but they're very very tight relative to the 20-year average so from our perspective we have been making some adjustments within the portfolio going from credit which is expensive into equities where we see um, better opportunities really. Okay and maybe to think about that as as opportunity and change we've been through a round of calls and discussions with our with our managers George was there any key themes that you were maybe taking away from that in terms of activity of our managers what some of the things they might have been changing within their within their funds? Yeah absolutely I mean echo Paul's point for a select number of our managers also seeing the opportunity of using equities and sovereign bonds relative to credit at this point in mm-hmm. time. Credit, as we say, spreads are qu- pretty tight. Ultimately, that means that they're expensive yeah. relative to their long-term history. In terms of what we're seeing in bond markets, just over the last number of weeks, some of our managers have used the opportunity of bond yields moving higher in the UK market to move from cash into gilts shorter dated so they have been less sensitive to some of the moves which we've seen over the last two or three weeks in the equity market. One of the uh, changes that we've seen across a select number of our managers, Growth Aligned being one, we've seen it with UBS um, as another example, is using um, a, a more nuanced approach to accessing the, the US market. Mm. What I mean by that is you've got the S&P 500 which is the top 500 companies in the States and it's weighted within the index depending upon their market caps or their market value within that. And what you tend to get is quite a large concentration at the top end to those companies who've used a lot of debt to accelerate their growth rate. And that can make them quite sensitive to higher interest rates mm. or higher financing costs because they need to repay the interest on that debt. And in that, it means the valuation on that subset of the market is quite high. So our managers are looking at areas such as the S&P 500 equal weight, which gives an equal proportion to each of those companies. And what that does is it allows you to access the fundamentals which are more supportive for the US market, such as the more robust economic data that we have seen through the course of the year, but get it at a valuation which is more attractive and Mm. therefore makes it less sensitive to volatility and interest rates 
Yeah. So there's there's two that's, examples. That's very useful. Thank a you. A lot a lot of um, a lot of opportunities which the managers are are seeing um, on a nuanced yeah. basis. Of course, what makes our portfolios special is the diversification yeah. of the way in which our managers both think and implement as well. Yeah. But there's two examples okay. there. Thank you, George. And maybe Chris to, to bring that together then from yeah. from your perspective with the the true potential portfolio solution. What have been some of the the changes that you might have been making to that, and and how should we think about those for our, our clients? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you know, George and Paul have covered quite well the kind of asset allocation mm. changes. So how we're thinking around the equity side of things. Equity allocations have increased since the start mm-hmm. of the year. So we've got just under fifty eight percent in equity in the balance portfolio right now. We came into the year with around about fifty three percent. So what we've been seeing is that we have had uh, a fairly constructive view as mm-hmm. we look through this year. Economic data has surprised to the upside. In general, you know, things have, have been good. Yeah. And we've backed that. So we've been willing to add to equity, particularly through, for example, say US equities, as George said. I think from a manager perspective, which is probably something that we haven't covered, the key trades this year have been building up one of our managers that we launched last year, mm-hmm. which will be Pictay. So just as a reminder, uh, Pictay, the kind of key specialism that they have is that they invest thematically. So what do I mean by that? And we use a lot of different terms in investment mm-hmm. and quite often people don't really explain what they mean. What they look at is they look at individual trends that they believe will be future sources of growth and then they find ways to invest in those future sources of growth so that can be things such as technology nutrition water Mm -hmm. scarcity etc if we look at how that fund's constructed it tends to be a lot more exposed to u.s equities compared to the rest of the tp peers we like that you know it's one of the kind of key themes Mm -hmm. that we have right now in respect of our asset allocation and as well as that it gives us a chance to further add to our equities overall. Yeah. So um, for us, that's the, the kind of key addition that we've been making within the portfolios. Where we've been taking that money from, the majority of money has come from 7IM. Now 7IM has a slightly different view to Picte in that they're positioned a little bit more defensively and that is away from our view overall. So we've just taken a little bit of money away from there very conscious of still having that diversification mm. by fund manager style which is is the key tenet of what we but do just in ter- sorry just in terms of the income portfolios the key changes which clients will see come through at the cautious side is more around risk management given that we've got uh, cautious managers balance managers and growth yep. managers we've got a barbell so the changes we, you'll see are bringing you um, closer towards the, the midpoint of the risk and if we look at the balanced portfolio, balanced income, that is, then what we've seen is we've got the opportunity to increase our equity exposure at the margin. We're doing this through uh, managers such as Threadneedle, which is a stock picker. Mm. Uh, so very select in terms of what they're buying and the price at which they're buying, but also using UBS in that exposure as well. So UBS was one of the managers we introduced in the early part of last year. So ultimately, paving way for what we believe is a better opportunity from both a, y- a yield and a return perspective. And Chris, I just wanted to take you back to something yeah, you said where the, the equity overall exposure has increased yeah. to where we are today. And where has that increase then been funded from from the other assets in which we can invest from a multi-asset perspective and, and why? Yeah, sure. That's a good question. It sort of filters in a little bit with, with kind of what George and Paul were saying. So if we look at where uh, the money has come from, probably say it's come from two areas. So the first area is from alternative assets. Mm -hmm. So we really like alternative assets. We think they're a real differentiator compared to what a lot of of other people in the marketplace are doing right now. However, what we're also conscious of is that yields within fixed income Mm -hmm. are clearly much, much higher compared to what they were 18 months ago. And tactically, we see that as attractive. Therefore, principally... In, in government bonds it will yeah. be yeah sorry yeah yeah within government bonds so for us you know we're quite happy holding a barbell of government mm-hmm. bonds of equity being underweight credit and right now underweight alternative assets as well okay. so for us that's where we see the most opportunity right now okay and as we're looking to the 
sort of the next weeks and weeks ahead, what are some of the key things that we'll be probably focusing in on? And I'll maybe look to, to Paul and Kevin for, for some of their thoughts from a, a growth yeah. aligned perspective. A couple of things really. Um, part of the inflation cycle, evidence where the, the disinflation continues, we expect that to broaden out away from the US. We want to mm -hmm. see more evidence of that, but it'd be interesting to see how wages particularly say in the UK, which has been remarkably strong, how yeah. that trends. Yeah. Um, but something that we've been looking at is the manufacturing cycle. Mm -hmm. We start to see that trough a little bit um, in the US and more globally. We want to see further evidence of that. We've seen the likes of Taiwan, Sweden, uh, perhaps leading indicators of the manufacturing cycle yeah. start to turn up, but we want to see more. Um, so we'll be looking to that. Okay. Kevin, from your I think the earnings cycle, very yeah. important. So it looks like the US earnings recession, X energy has ended. So we've mm -hmm. had four quarters, or well, at least four quarters of contraction in earnings in the US outside of the energy sector. That looks to have ended. Yeah. Look out, I think we should be um, vigilant for some potential upgrades from corporates as, they, as we go through this quarter. I think the other big signal we're going to watch for is the end of this week. We've got the annual symposium of the US Federal Reserve and any yep. signals they get they are willing to give that the interest rate hiking cycle may actually be at an end. We should, yep. we've had downside inflation surprises in the US this year. Mm -hmm. Inflation looks likely to undershoot their yep. projections for the end of the year. That would fit with there being no need to raise interest rates further. So I think we're all, we're all vigilant to a signal from um, Chair Powell on Friday that they might be willing to just hold part for now and just uh, see how inflation evolves. And certainly that will give us something to be discussing next week in the terms of, of morning markets Absolutely. and where we go with that. Yep. So, well, with that, many thanks to, to everyone for their thoughts today. Certainly from a viewer's perspective, there's been a lot going on in asset markets. Yes, it's been a challenge from an equity and potentially also from the, the fixed interest side. But hopefully what we've done today is to bring that to life as to why the linkage is there between what's happened in bond markets and how it's impacted equity markets. Many thanks.